Welcome. We are here backstage with Jeffrey Morrissey again at the Paradise Rock Club. I have the pleasure of being joined by James Vincent McMorrow. Thank you so much for making the time for us today. No problem at all. How's everything been so far? Good. Hectic. Good. Strange time to be in America. Well, that's it. You, you, you anticipated my next question. Uh, that, yeah. what, what is your reaction to everything that's happened and how have you had to, how have the shows been? Have you had to like change anything, <laughs> cater anything more to it? Or? No, I think what's interesting is that certain songs have taken on a particular resonance for the crowd that they weren't. So we played New York the night before the election and it was like a big celebration. It was like, it's just the, it was the biggest show we've ever done in New York and it just felt really hype. And the crowd, I think there was like an energy to it where they were like, anything is possible. And then two days later, the day after the election, we played in DC and it was like, the feeling around everywhere was just like, like a funeral. It was like the whole city was like in mourning. Um, and then I think when we played the show, I kind of, I didn't really want to talk about it because I don't think that that's something that people want from me. I don't, like, I'm happy to talk about it, but I don't feel like it's my job to talk. So I just played the, sh we just tried to play the show, but it was intense. And then certain lyrics and certain songs were kind of taking on quite a resonance for the crowd. You could see a different reaction, for sure, yeah. Yeah, it, it's been it's been quite a time to be here, and then plus yeah. the loss of Leonard Cohen yesterday, just kind of when you thought the week couldn't it, get any worse. Get any worse, yeah, that was heavy. That was just like five minutes before we went on stage yesterday, so that was a big kind of. It felt like he knew, <laughs> like he was like, it's time to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. And he was another one, that's sort of similar to David Bowie, who released an album weeks before his death that almost seemed to foretell it. I know he he definitely had like a sense because I remember he wrote a letter to somebody. Um, and it was it popped up online i think her family released it like a friend of his or something that had passed away and it sort of said i'm not far behind you so he kind of clearly knew that something was about to happen i don't know whether he'd been sick or not but he definitely knew he was he wasn't long for this world and do you have a particular song of his that you tend to cover or that you might learn how to pick up i mean like the obvious thing to talk about would be hallelujah because that was the first song of his that was like a, but i heard it through the jeff buckley version when i was a kid um and then like um like Marianne, or um, I think I, I like I, I'm a big fan. He had an '80s record called um, "I'm Your Man," which had some strange songs on it, like "Jazz Police," which are wacky, like really bizarre. And when you listen to, I played them for people last night, and they're like, "This is crazy." But I loved that record when I was a kid because I just thought it was really bizarre. And uh, he has just these really strange inclinations, and but ly lyrically, he's amazing. Yeah. Without a doubt, a, a true genius. And yeah. uh, do you have a favorite version of Hallelujah? I feel like this is something that people could debate for yeah. forever and ever. I mean, the Jeff Buckley version, I think, is the indelible version, as as great as the as the original was. And the fact that he wrote that when he was 50, I think, is crazy. I think that's that's the, when he wrote it. Um, it's it, like you know, he wrote it, therefore his version is the best. But if you'd ask me, like which is my favorite, it would be the Jeff version, just because it was the one that got me into a world of music that I hadn't been in before, so it has a resonance for me. And I, am, I quite like the Rufus Wainwright version as well, but I think that the Jeff one is the one for me. Well, uh, 20, as I, I was talking to another band last night, 2016 is not all bad. You released an album, which yeah. is pretty, pretty good, We yeah. Move. Um, it was an album that was emotionally uh, intense for you to make. Um, when did you know that you would be able to make it? that makes sense and you'd be able to address these things um i think coming off the back of the second record and feeling a sense of like accomplishment with that record but also more more prevalent feeling was like a sense of unfinished business like i had wished in hindsight that i had released one or two songs off that record before i'd finished the record itself because hearing the reaction to it gave me a sense of purpose where you know when i put a cavalier off that record and people responded so well i was worried that people might react negatively because it was such a step out for me sonically and I was really trying to uh, like dig into the sounds that I've always wanted to dig into a bit more. So once I did that, once I realized that people were not only accepting of it but really kind of embracing of the idea of someone like me pushing myself forward like that, it gave me the impetus to kind of go, go further and further. And then through that release process of the second album just kind of working away, it definitely started to build up in my mind like what the record needed to be and how it needed to sound and the prevailing thought was just like an, a more of an honest um, assessment of my life um, more open on that level and when uh, people closest to you, family and friends heard the record when they read the interviews did you were a lot of people reaching out to you or have you received sort of like personal feedback yeah, yeah yeah like yeah friends and family like my mom especially is very like um, I think because you know like I've, I've, I've been quite successful for a number of years now five or six and she's gotten used to me being like the person that I am and the person that people talk about 
to her. You know what I mean? What happens when one of your children is quite successful is people want to talk to you about that child all the time. So she gets used to it, and she kind of is in my world as well because she, she does work for me along with my like accountants and stuff. So she's kind of used to my world. But I think this was a different side of it. Like she just saw, she saw a side of me that I hadn't shown probably in public, um, and I think that she had a sense of pride, which I quite I thought was quite nice because, you know, your parents and your family are supposed to support you. You know what I mean? So like it was just nice to see her react in a way that was like, like it reson it just resonated with me. It was nice to see it. Um, yeah. Mothers are the best. Yeah. Um, and then so uh, along with sort of the change in subject matter, lyrically came more of a, a stylistic shift as well. How are those two decisions related and tied together? Did you feel like because you were addressing something different, you know, you had to take on a different genre, or was it something that just kind of, huh, this is where this is going? No, I think that this has just been where this has been going for a, for a long time now in hindsight. Like the markers are there on both of the first two albums, and I think that's in terms of like the instruments used and the sonics, so it wasn't to me a shift, it was more just a consolidation of like the ideas and a refinement of them. And a consistency of sound as well, like I think that's the thing, like if I was to have made 10 songs that sounded like Cavalier on my second record, I think we would have had this record, I think that was where my thinking was, it was like, like I said earlier, I wished that I had released that song because it gave me a sense of like, like yeah I have this, I know what I'm doing. Um, so I think that, that that was very much always going to be the case as soon as I released that record, that this album would lean into that more um, more purposefully and, and like more consistently across the board. Um, I wouldn't know, I, I don't, I think, I mean, maybe there is something to be said for like, as I was making that, that the idea of just being more like honest to my own personal loves and my own, and, and my own personal like wants as a musician definitely bled into the, the, the lyrics themselves where it was like, um, being more honest but there was no like considered conversation on my part I didn't really think about that I just thought let's make the thing that I want to make and this was how it just came out well and, and I mean that's interesting here too because if you were to read stuff about the album you would think that We Move was like a, a death punk type album people are like it's a ch sound change I'm like and, and as you said it, it's not like this came out of left field or, no. or anything no um, so it must be sort of interesting to read different things like that too. It, it is it's different it's What's interesting about it is that I think that if you actually, I've had I've had so many conversations with people like yourself about this record, and when we start talking and people say that, like you know, it's a shift, it's a change, and then I go, well, actually, no, it's not really. To my mind, they're always like, oh no, no, I totally agree, it's not. So I'm like, well, why do we say that? I think that it's it's just like you say, it's part been part of the narrative of the record is like people see these names of the people that I worked with. And then they think about me historically, and they they just their own mind automatically goes to, oh, this is a change, this is a shift, and it is because I've never worked with people before, let alone people that work in the sphere that like 85 or Frank or Ben work in. So there was very much a sense of like that was the the, the original conversation. But yeah, I don't think if you were to have if you know my career, I don't think it came that much out of the blue. Um, I just think that yeah, if you were coming to this, and that, that's that's a fair thing as well, is that there's a lot of people, there's a lot more tension on this record than there's ever been on anything I've done before. So maybe a lot of people are feeling like they're just coming to it new. They're not as well versed in my records historically, so there there will always be then a, a sense of like, oh, this is like totally different because they're just reading a press release. You know, they might just have that idea. It's funny that you, you use the word press release because I interviewed um, Matt Berninger from the National, and sure. I like brought up like something again, something that was written. He's like, I put that in the press release, and I have regretted putting it in the press release like since yeah. since the day it came out. Yeah, it's hard because I understand where press people come from. Like their job is to try and like get you in as many people's inboxes as possible, and in order to do that, there has to be an amount of clickbaitiness to it. And I hate that word, and I hate that idea. And I've worked really hard to try and like minimize it, and worked to create things that are tasteful on all levels but ultimately that is if I, if you're someone like me um and I don't know when that ma that national thing was but if it, if it was pre you know high violet then maybe there was still a sense of like we need to put certain things in in order to like get people to like pay attention to the thing there is that conversation that happens it's like I worked with these people on this record they've all worked in very big worlds and I have been part of certain records over the last year that are quite well known and quite big parts in those roles in those records are very passive very minimal but on paper it reads really well so 
they tend to make a lot of that because that works. It, it, it you know, it, it will get you into the the ears and eyes of people that might never have, have listened to you before. So I understand the principle of it, but yeah, there are certain things that you go, I wish that wasn't in there. I wish it had been further deeply buried in the press release itself. Yeah, it was the uh, the Elvi project. So okay. it was his, his yeah. side thing that people needed to pay attention to. Exactly, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. But um, what is sort of the favorite record or favorite period, uh, period to play live? Like when you get out there, do you have like a favorite phase, if that makes sense, to play? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this point right, uh, right now is very interesting because when a record comes out, there's always an amount of hype and excitement in a room. The most important and the most interesting point for a musician in an album cycle is probably six, seven months after it comes out, mm -hmm. because that's when you really get a sense of like what is happening. Um, like the sense that you get right now is that like things have definitely gotten a lot busier and a lot more exciting in the rooms. And obviously, you know, like you know, we go to most cities now, and, and everything tends to be sold out, and the rooms that we play are a lot bigger than probably what we finished up on on the last album so your sense would be oh things have really you know are getting more exciting and much much bigger and the response and think songs are being played on the radio that were never being played before but it's what happens in six months time that tends to like give you a sense of like how an album is resonating with people because the way we digest music these days is just so intense and the turnover is so quick it's very hard to hold people's attention for a long time and I spent a lot of time on this record hoping that it wouldn't like trying to not make it the thing that I dislike about music which is like when people put out records and they're like they're just like smash you over the head really quickly and then they dissipate there's nothing more to them to keep you coming back I've always tried to make music that had that sense even if it was frustrating at times for people because it wouldn't reveal itself very easily even with a record like this that's much more plain spoken and easy to digest on a superficial level my goal is for a six seven months down the time for down the line for this record to still mean something to people that they might get more out of it in six months than they get now well and that's an interesting thing because it's a record that i definitely enjoy coming back to yeah. as well and sort of listening to again yeah that's my favorite records are, are all those albums like and, and i have this like everybody else because i just i'm so used to just listening to music on spotify and having it so easily accessible to me that like i just i throw myself in albums headlong these days like i'll just listen to the same album 10 times in a row which I used to do all the time but then because I have access to all this other music I'll then just drift off whereas in the past if I only had a CD in my car or something like that like 10 years ago when I was a kid it would just be like I'm just going to listen to this album all the time whereas now it's like no I'm going to listen to these 75 other records that I also can just like pick up super quick so you have to work twice as hard to make a record and to conceptualize it to make it something that does the same thing that a record might have done 10 years ago because it's just not the same thing. You can't approach it the same way. You have to make it a little frustrating for people or a little difficult to digest easily. Yeah. And what was that CD for you as a kid that you had in the car? Oh, well, I mean, the National, like, Boxer by the National would be, like, the most obvious, like, car record for me. Like, that when, like, I heard that album, I, it, it never left my car. Like, it's probably still in my car, to be <laughs> honest. Like, I don't listen to CDs really anymore, but, like, so it's probably still there. Like that record was huge for me. Um, trying to think before that. Um, I mean, when I heard, I mean, I heard like like I am a bird now by Anthony and the Johnsons. That was another one for me that was like definitely like obsessed over in my car. In search of by Annie or D. Definitely obsessed over in my car. Um, yeah, so, yeah, it's records like that. And so, and records are, are a huge, I don't know, I feel like the record has sort of died a little bit, it's just more like a collection yeah. of singles, but sure. it's an important thing. You've released three very solid records, um, but what would you tell to the James McMurrow who is releasing early in the morning? What, if you could look, take him aside, <laughs> talk to him today, whether that be about writing, releasing, however you would interpret it, what would you say? Um, super easy, I would just tell him to be less precious um, about things that don't matter. That's the one thing that you I've learned is the things that I put a value on actually aren't the things that other people put a value on and that doesn't make them worthless at all but then when that becomes the case you have to think about whether you really want to fight for those things are you fighting for them just to be precious or are you fighting for them because you really believe in those ideas and I think when I was making early in the morning I put so much time and value on things that I really didn't have to like I was making that record with no money and no really fixed agenda because I didn't have a label or didn't have anywhere to really put it so I could have just thrown myself at it with a level of like, lack of regard that I think would have been beneficial to it. Instead, I approached it from a very like, precious, workmanlike way. And I really kind of like, 
I, in the end, it was very much a grind to try and get it done. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't have been as successful as it was. You know, that album quietly sold like 130, 140,000 records, which was insane. But I don't know whether that wouldn't have been the case if I hadn't treated it so preciously in the beginning. Because they're just songs and they're just ideas. And I listen to it and I think it sounds labored because I think that I was just too precious. Yeah, that's how I feel. That's good advice. Yeah. Um, and then, so you've released, as I mentioned, three records, and you said that with We Move, one to three felt more complete, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I feel like that the obvious question becomes, what about, what does four look like? Because I know you're a workaholic, and you must be yeah. thinking about it yeah. somewhat. So I, I guess, yeah, if one and three are complete, then what does four look like? I think that I, like, I, I have a, I always have a good sense of something coming out once I come out of a record I'm always kind of fired up and I'm working and then what happens is like I, we get stuck in the touring mode and I'm tired because it's just an exhausting schedule so then the ideas tend to like sort of drift to the back of my sort of my mind a little bit they're in sort of my they're in my nice scope of vision but they're very much on the periphery um, and I'm kind of embracing this the way I th like making the the third album was the first time where I was like I understand how I make music and I understand where my mind is and what it's thinking so I'm just going to embrace all aspects of it so I'm trying to do that again um, and just like if ideas come to me I'm just like documenting them and keeping them and then not necessarily thinking about where it's going to go next My because I like I say I know that it's going to go somewhere new because that's just my instinct um, and as a songwriter I feel like I've I know where I'm going now and the songwriting to me is always the the anchor of the records mm -hmm. so everything else is up for grabs everything else can be played with so I think that being the case I don't know where it's going to go um, I learned so much making this record from the guys that worked on it with me and I want to take those things and try and apply them myself and try and see what I can do now I guess as well I like to pl and I like to play a little bit more like I think that's the one thing is I, I spent so much time with this record traveling and it was just me and the guitar, me and a keyboard and everything kind of came together in a very like, like, um, it was like a jigsaw, every, all these different pieces. Whereas now I just feel like sitting in a room and just playing drums for four weeks. So maybe over Christmas I'll just do that in my studio and just try and see what happens, but no agenda. So do you think it'll be a little bit less collaborative if that makes sense or is that an aspect that you want to keep? I love the idea of collaboration. I love it and I think it worked really well on this record and, and in, the, in those three people and the other guys that worked on this record I found some really kindred spirits and uh, I would definitely want to like revisit that. I'm not in the mood to be like I found those guys and now I moved on to someone else. Like mm -hmm. The thing to remember with the people that worked on this record is that they are all since I worked with it in 1985 he, he is like the biggest he is like yeah like the biggest music producer if you go in terms of sales on the planet like so that happened since we worked on the record so I have to be realistic about my you know we're friends and he'll always give me his time and energy but like you know he's produced like two of the biggest singles three of the biggest singles of the last two three years and he's definitely busy so I can't be sitting around waiting for people that, so you know you have to and same with Frank he, you know he's produced two huge Rihanna songs and a bunch of different stuff and these guys are just busy people so I have to be realistic to that well, and you're a part of that too. I mean, if he's if he's sold all these records, some of those are obviously your records yeah, as well. Yeah, no, I mean, true. Yeah, I mean, like that's technically true. And and like the thing with a record like this, the reason that they wanted to be part of it is because these guys are are truly musicians, and they want to expand beyond just the you know what's in the same way that I want to, in the same way that like I reject the ideas that people put upon me and want to define my own narrative in the same way that everybody in life does these guys are the same like if someone is known as being the guy that produces all the singles for drake that's amazing because obviously that's a huge deal for someone like 85 but again he's so much more than that he can do so much more this record to these people i think was definitely like an opportunity to stretch themselves out so uh, you know i hope that they're proud of that and i hope that again when it comes time to make another record that they'll want to they'll want to help me in the way that they helped me before and in a way that i, I know i've reciprocated with them all I, we work on lots of different things together so i think that, i mean we're friends and friendship counts for a lot to me and for them too hopefully that's what I like to hear. Friendship yeah. counts for a lot. And the yeah. Drake collaboration was really cool, by the way. Thank you. I, I, yeah, I did cool. have to mention. And then um, speaking of defining your own narrative and tours being exhausting, you do a ton of these interviews. What do you wish people asked you more about? Um, that's a good question. Like, people ask me a lot of questions, and, and, and it's hard to, like, get sometimes. I like when people just let me talk. Like, that's the one thing about interviews is I think that you get the best stuff out of an interview when you just let someone kind of go, this is how I feel about 
my music and about life and you just want to like the more I talk the looser it gets and the better it gets so it's not necessarily about asking pointed or specific questions it's just a, sort of about like opening up the field to have a conversation about who I am and where I come from because in this day and age when it's so much about personality and so much about like who you are and your connection with the the people making the music or the people consuming it it, it makes a difference to kind of know what they were thinking so that was what I would say Totally, totally. And then this will be my last question. Who are you listening to? And since we're getting close to the end of 2016, what have been some of your favorite albums of 2016? Uh, I mean, at the moment, like that Solange record is, is really kind of high up my list. Mm -hmm. um, sonically, it's absolutely amazing. Like, I'm a huge Raphael Sadiq fan, and he did a lot of the production on it, so it sounds flawless. And she's just, she's just got a really beautiful aesthetic going on. It's just the way she's thinking about that album, the way she conceptualized it is like so perfectly articulated. Um, kind of fits alongside the Beyonce record as well for me in that they both made these quite beautiful narrative works. But for me, the Solange record just works perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorite records of the year is this band called Pine Grove. It was kind of a band that a lot of people missed. Um, it's a beautiful album. Um, it's called Cardinal. There's the first song on it called Old Friends. It was definitely my favorite song of the year. Just a really beautiful song that I think everybody should listen to. Um, though I think, like, I love the Frank Ocean record. I love the Bonnie Vera record. I thought it was a really mm. beautiful, like, just a beautiful piece of work, which, which is really interesting because it's only, like, 30 minutes long, but he has managed to make it sound so much longer in a lovely way, which to me is indicative of a really great record that, like, it, it's over... And it doesn't feel like it's too short, even though it's only 30 minutes long. He's done something really interesting with it, where he's condensed his ideas down, which I love. Um, I think the Frank record is beautiful. Um, I think they're like the main ones that I've sort of been listening to a lot recently. I'm sure if like you gave me 30 minutes, I would think of like the 10 other ones that I like. But they're just the ones that are like prescient in my mind right now. Yeah. Perfect. Cool. Well, James Hinson McMurrow, the album is We Move. It is a beautiful album. Thank you. Uh, love it. Love the hat as well. And thank, <laughs> thank you, you. Uh, for spending time with us Absolute today. Absolute pleasure. Thanks.